Okay, Gospel of Matthew, Matthew for Beginners. This is lesson number seven in the series. If you're following in your Bibles, it will be Matthew chapter 11. We're doing narrative number three, and the title of the lesson, Jesus Faces Skepticism. All right, I think we've got all the preamble there, quite a title. All right, so so far Matthew has described an almost interrupted ascension of Jesus' uh, ministry. I mean, if you kind of look at what's happened, you've had the baptism at the Jordan, the voice from heaven, you know, the appearance of the dove, a miraculous uh, demonstration and confirmation of his person, the defeat of Satan in the desert, you know, in the wilderness, uh, miracles and ministry among the people, then he chooses and he sends disciples to preach and to heal in his name. You know, it's like just, just one way, just going up and up all the way. Now when we get to the third narrative, which is where we are now, Matthew describes the questioning that the Jews would begin to, uh, uh, to make about him, and the questions would become more and more direct and aggressive as his ministry prospered. You know? So the better he's getting, the more people that are being drawn, obviously pushback. So there's going to start the pushback here. So chapter 11 serves as a kind of a bridge between the discourse where he was sending the apostles out with instructions and new encounters that the Lord himself would have with John's disciples and the Pharisees as he continued his work of preaching and teaching in all the cities. So this narrative deals with the doubt and the skepticism of both John the Baptist and the Pharisees as well. So let's get into chapter 11. Uh, I don't normally read a lot here. I've always asked you to kind of read ahead so you're familiar with the material, but we will read just a couple of verses here in chapter uh, 11, verses uh, two to six. It says, now when John, while imprisoned, heard uh, of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the expected one or shall we look for someone else? And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. So Matthew <laughs> mentions that John had been imprisoned earlier and now John sends his disciples to ask Jesus, you know, are you the Messiah? Are you really the one? You know, uh, he, there's some sort of, he's having a problem, right? So John is doubting and comes to Jesus through his disciples for an answer to his question. Now, John had preached that when the Messiah would come, there would be judgment. That's what he was saying. You better get ready. You better get ready because when the Messiah comes, you know, the ax is going to be to the root of the tree. He's going to clean house. All right, so he's saying judgment is going to come. We're going to get rid of the dead branches. The dead weight's going to be gone. Well, so far, none of that has happened. The Messiah has come, you know, there's been a sign and so on and so forth, and his ministry has increased. He's doing miracles, so on and so forth, and John's ministry has decreased. But contrary to the idea that there's going to be judgment and the bad guys are going to get their just desserts, John is imprisoned. And in his mind, that's not the way it's supposed to go. The Messiah comes, along with the Messiah comes the judgment. So Jesus' response is to show John that everything that he is doing is in line with what the Old Testament said that the Messiah would do when He came. Isaiah, for example, 35 verse 6 said that when the Messiah would come, He would heal, He would preach, He would teach. In uh, Isaiah 61 verse 1, same idea, when the Messiah came, He would preach the good news and so on and so forth. So John had an agenda of time and when uh, all the stuff was supposed to happen and when it didn't happen right away, he began to doubt. So the Messiah's coming was to be in two ways. One way was to be a dispensation of grace. The kingdom has come, salvation to all men, the spirit to all people. You know. 
That was one thing that was supposed to happen. And then there was also a dispensation of judgment. Okay? What John didn't understand was that the first coming with grace and patience and forgiveness, that's what, you know, that's what we're living in now and continue to live in until Jesus returns when He will come with judgment, Acts 17, 30, 31. And this will occur in God's own time, but we shouldn't doubt that it will happen. Now in another series, remember I explained to you the thing about prophecy? We know the sequence of events, how they're going to happen, but what we don't know is the time frame between the sequence. We don't know that. So John assumed that when the Messiah came, the judgment would come along with him. He didn't understand that there'd be a period of time between the coming of the Messiah and the judgment. As a matter of fact, there are two judgments, weren't there? The first judgment would be against the Jewish nation, and that happened some 30 odd years after the appearance of the Messiah. In 70 AD, the judgment that God said that would come on the nation for having rejected the Savior happened, 70 AD, the Romans come, they surround the city for 18 months, lay siege to the city, they burn it down, destroy the temple, destroy everything, kill everybody. That was the judgment, right? And of course, uh, if you telescope that to the end, there's another judgment coming. The Messiah has come, we're living in the age now where we're under grace, right? The kingdom of God is being built here on earth and so on and so forth, but there is another judgment coming and that's when Jesus returns and then the final judgment will come. But the thing I want us to remember about this episode is that John didn't understand that there would be time between events. He assumed those things would happen together. Okay? And so Jesus doesn't go to all the lengths that I have to explain this to John. He just says to John, look, the, 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 the scripture said that when the Messiah would come, miracles would happen, teaching would happen, so on and so forth would happen. Well, that's what's happening. So just you know, believe the word. Have confidence in the word and uh, accept what is taking place. All right? So Jesus says you know, not to be caught in the trap of disbelief concerning him that would cause one to lose faith or be destroyed. Interesting, you know, when he says um, the one who, who stumbles, the Greek word there is for trap, and, it, and, and, a, and a, tra a type of trap that if you get caught in it, it, uh, it kills you. So he said, be careful not to be caught into the in the trap of doubt. Okay, so then Jesus goes on to give a, uh, a witness about John, just in case people might have lost their confidence that John was you know, legitimate prophet, he demonstrated some doubt there at some point. So Jesus says about John, hey, this John, he was, a, he was truly a prophet, verses seven to nine in this uh, chapter. He says that John was the fulfillment concerning the one who was to come in order to prepare the way for the Messiah. The, the prophet said before the Messiah comes, someone else will come before him to announce his arrival. And Jesus is confirming John the Baptist, he was that person. Uh, Jesus says that John had the greatest prestige of any prophet because of his proximity to the Lord. Some prophets prophesied that in hundreds of years or way into the future sometime the Messiah would come and then another prophet would say, well, he's going to come, you know, be patient. You know? But John the Baptist was the very last one. He was actually in the presence of the Messiah pointing to him, actually pointing to him physically. His, you know, his disciples were questioning him and John would point to Jesus and say, no, no, you, you go after him. The, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So his greatness is not because he was a powerful preacher or he was a good man and all that kind of stuff, which he was. His greatness was uh, determined by his proximity to the one he was prophesying about, which was Jesus. He was a contemporary of Jesus. Now then, Jesus says, uh, he was great, but he's not as great as those who are in the kingdom. Kind of a contradiction, isn't it? Because you know, we're not great prophets, and we're not, in, you know, we're not contemporaries of, of, of Jesus in the sense of when he was on earth. But the thing that John the Baptist did not have is he did not have the Holy Spirit. 
the power of the Spirit was working in him in his ministry, but he didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that was the great promise of the Old Testament. When the Messiah comes, not just the prophets and not just the kings and not just the judges and not just the Samsons and the Davids and the Isaiahs, not just those few will have the Spirit and have it just for a time. Everybody will have it. Young, old, male, female, free, slave, everybody <coughs> will have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That was the kind of, that was the core of the promise. Okay, so that's why he says, as great as he was, he's not as great as the least in the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because every single person, the youngest person, the oldest, the poorest, the weakest person, all of them in the kingdom of God, they have the Holy Spirit within them. And already within them is the power to ultimately resurrect them from the dead. John the Baptist did not have that blessing. Then finally he said he was rejected, John, was uh, rejected in the same way that Jesus will be rejected. So the, these are uh, the, the Lord's comments concerning uh, John the Baptist. Uh, the kingdom, he says, is suffering violence, could also be translated to say that it is forcefully being established since John the Baptist uh, by John and by uh, Jesus. So in other words, the kingdom is coming to be, but not without problems, not without opposition. All right? Then uh, Jesus goes on to reproach the cities that rejected both him and John. You know, John's disciples question where the actual judgment was, and here Jesus reminds them and the disbelievers that a terrible judgment is coming. Now this particular passage may suggest degrees of punishment. You know, he says, boy, if you know, the people in Sodom and Gomorrah, they're going to suffer less than these people here, you people, you Jews today who are rejecting. And some people have kind of extrapolated from that that there's kind of degrees of you know, punishment, big punishment, little punishment. Uh, that's so if, if the meaning is the final judgment. However, the day of judgment uh, can also mean a time when they are punished as a nation. The day of judgment for the Jewish nation came uh, in 70 AD. That was their judgment. I mean, everyone will be judged at the end, you know, but their judgment as a nation came in 70 uh, AD. And the destruction of those other pagan cities, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah and so on and so forth, the point he's making here is that um, uh, these pagan cities who were much more sinful, much more immoral, was less painful than the terrible siege and suffering brought upon the Jewish nation in 70 AD. So yeah, Sodom and Gomorrah, yeah, they were destroyed and they were bad people, but they were destroyed, boom, you know, in a day. They were dead, you know, they were dead right away. Like you, you die in an earthquake, the building falls on top of you, you're dead. But the siege at Jerusalem, that lasted for almost two years. People were starving in the city. People were, you know, they were practicing cannibalism and they were killing each other and they were, it was terrible. And then when, they find, when the Romans finally came in, they just, you know, it's one thing to be shot, it's quite another thing to be stabbed to death by a Roman, uh, you know, by a Roman soldier carrying a, you know, a sword about that long or to be beaten to death with a piece of metal. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So he's saying, uh, yeah, these other nations, these pagan cities, they didn't believe and they were wicked and they were punished. But their punishment was not as bad, if you wish, as painful, as long lasting as the punishment that will come on Jerusalem when that judgment comes. And also throughout history, the Jewish nation has suffered terrible persecution. I'm not justifying the persecution that they've suffered. But nevertheless, they've had to suffer a terrible persecution throughout history. And so the suffering, of course, will be long lasting and uh, will be uh, terrible. Uh, First and Second Thessalonians speak of a, a, an equal reward and punishment for believers and unbelievers. In other words, the unbelievers in the end, the punishment will be the same. To be away from God forever, you know, that's even worse than two years of siege, okay? And, and being with the Lord forever, 
nobody cares about who's got the best seat in the house. <laughs> Everybody's got the best seat in the house. Okay? All right. Uh, then the invitation and promise for those who accepted the message of John and the arrival of Jesus. He keeps on going and Jesus makes a prayer here. And he prays in gratitude for those who did accept the message. He prays in a sense uh, making a promise to reveal the Father to all who come to the Son. And there's a claim to His own deity. Imagine Someone that says, if you come to me, I'm going to introduce you to God. You know, really? So who can do such a thing? You know, like I, Michael, you know, the Bible teacher, I can, I can tell you about God from what the scriptures say about Him, but I certainly can't introduce you to Him. You know, so Jesus is saying, if you believe in me, I'll introduce you, I'll make you to know the Father, to have a relationship with Him. And then He makes the invitation, you know, Come to me, all you who are uh, uh, burdened and heavy laden. I, you know, take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy and light, right? The yoke, of course, that he's talking about is the yoke of the law or the yoke of ignorance, the yoke of fear. And he says, I'll replace that yoke with a yoke of faith and a yoke of obedience to the teachings of Christ, which all, all, although demanding, are made easy and light by His mercy and His grace and His presence. So the yoke of the law or the yoke of ignorance, those are heavy, heavy yokes. Because the yoke of the law, uh, you, know, you, you have no hope. I can never be what I want to be if all you have is the law. And the yoke of ignorance and sin, well, that, that creates dread of, of judgment and guilt. You know, those yokes are heavy. Jesus says, take those off. Take my yoke, the yoke of faith. And that yoke is a yoke in the sense that you have to submit to somebody. Who would you rather submit to? You know, the demands of the law, the foolishness of ignorance and sin in this world? You, you want that to be your master? Or do you want me to be your master, he says? If I'm your master, we're dealing with you on a basis of grace and mercy and promise. So yes, there's obedience. Yes, you're in submission to me, but the kind of submission, wouldn't you rather be in submission to someone who loves you, who wants what's best for you, who can bless you and give you eternal life? That's what he's saying here. So Jesus responds to the inquiry of John and his disciples. All of this is, by the way, has been kicked off by John's question. All right, it's all one piece. So he responds to the inquiry of John and his disciples and he gives a witness towards John and he rebukes the cities that rejected him and the message of the kingdom and he reiterates his invitation to follow him. John, remember, was a, a great figure and he had lots of disciples. If John doubts, then a lot of Jesus' disciples used to be John's disciples. And so Jesus answers the doubt. He calms the disciples by, you know, he doesn't, what's the word? He doesn't denigrate John because of his doubt. He actually builds them up and tells them who John is. And then he re-invites them. You know, don't, don't doubt, he says. Believe, take my yoke, follow me. It'll be worth it. All right, so that's that part. And then we get to the part in chapter 12 uh, where there's the conflict with the Pharisees. So an ongoing conflict that uh, Jesus had with the Pharisees. They were the principal teachers of the nation along with the scribes. The Pharisees, they were a political party. You know, like you have, you know, in, in, in Congress, they're all politicians, right? They're all politicians. But some are Democrats and some are Republicans and some are you know, whatever. Well, they were all scribes. They were all lawyers of the law. But some of them belonged to the party of the Pharisees. Okay, so all Pharisees were scribes, but not all scribes were Pharisees. Do you understand? And the Pharisees, again, as I've explained in another place, um, came to, to the fore during the Maccabean period, during the intertestamentary time. There was tremendous influence among the Jews. The Greek influence was very strong. They were losing their language. They were losing their culture. They were also beginning to reject 
the scriptures and they were beginning to depend more and more on Greek philosophy and worldliness and so on and so forth. And so a group of men, a group of scribes rose up to defend the scriptures, you know, back to the Bible type thing. And they were very adamant about uh, how it was important to stay with the scriptures and so on and so forth. And they were called the separated ones. They, they were separating themselves from the world, from worldliness, from Greek ideas, and they were you know, pure, they were Puritans for the word of God. Well, separated ones, the word is Pharisees. So as I mentioned before, they were heroes at one time. Okay? Heroes of the people. But with time, they began to abuse their positions and they began to impose things on the people that were not in the, in the scriptures themselves. So that's who the Pharisees was, were. And Jesus was, you know, was in conflict with them almost from the beginning because Jesus was popular as a teacher, regardless of his miracles. And he posed a threat to their position and influence. And so they were determined at the beginning simply to discredit him because he was threatening their position. This aggression began as a form of questions concerning his conduct and teachings and finally ended in a plot to kill him. So they just started by just trying to you know, find poke holes in his teachings and in the end uh, you know, trying to uh, assassinate him. So the first question uh, or accusation is the accusation that he is breaking the Sabbath in chapter 12. Again, we're not going to read. The Pharisees basically accused Jesus' disciples of breaking the Sabbath by plucking ears of corn and eating them. They're walking through a field, they're hungry, they grab some corn and, they, and they're just eating it. You know? And so the Pharisees accused them, you're breaking the Sabbath because you're working on the Sabbath day. Now the Sabbath law that they had created forbade 39 types of work on the Sabbath, and one of them was harvesting. You weren't allowed, farmer was not allowed to harvest the crop on Sabbath day. A scribe, for example, who wasn't a farmer, okay, a scribe was not allowed to work on that day. He couldn't carry his instruments of work you know, with him. That would be considered work, so it became ridiculous. You couldn't walk further than a certain distance from your village. Let's say it was a mile, okay? Uh, because that would be considered work, because you were, you were and, and the Jews found all kinds of ways around these laws, too many laws, you find loopholes, right? So for the one for, you, know, you can't go more than a mile, well they'd walk in a mile in their sandals and they'd take off their sandals and then keep walking. <laughs> I mean, right, it was ridiculous and what they were doing uh, was ridiculous. But based on this, these kinds of rules, they were accusing Jesus' disciples of harvesting on the Sabbath and all they were doing was just, you know, grabbing one thing and, and eating it. So Jesus responds by showing them that God's law concerning mercy towards suffering and need is higher than the ceremonial law. Very important concept. You see, God installed ceremonial laws for man's benefit in worship, but when these clashed with human need and mercy, one was to conduct oneself according to the higher set of principles involved in dispensing justice and mercy. For example, uh, you know, uh, David ate the showbread. He was hungry with his soldiers. There was no food. And uh, the showbread could only be eaten by the priests. And since there was no other food, the priests allowed them to eat the showbread. Why? Because mercy is higher than ceremony. Okay? Uh, the, um, uh, the Good Samaritan, right? The, the person is robbed and beaten and left naked, you know, uh, exposed out in the wilderness. And doesn't it say a priest comes by and he says, oh man, if I, if I help this guy, I'll have to touch him. And if I touch him, I'll be unclean. And if I'm unclean, I won't be able to go to the temple to, to worship and do my things. So, uh, you know, surely God doesn't want me to be unclean. So he walks around him. You know, this idea. Okay. So, Jesus shows that ceremonial law was even broken by the priests themselves because they had to work in order to perform their duties on the Sabbath. 
So he rebukes them for not discerning between the form, which is temple and sacrifices and so on and so forth, and all those, all those forms, all those ceremonies were there to help lead them eventually to Christ. What were the animal sacrifices but simply object lessons that you know, a, 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 a life was required in order to atone for sins. That's all, they, they kept learning that object lesson for hundreds of years. And so the substance of the law, and the substance of the law and the ceremony was Jesus Himself, the giver of the law, the reason for the ceremonies. You know, we have modern day examples. I don't want to go too deep into this here, you know, because we're trying to do a textual study, but I think we can bring it home. Sometimes people get angry and upset at each other and refuse to have fellowship with each other because they, they differ on how the communion should be served. Some brethren, you know, they have unleavened bread and they have a cup, one cup of you know, fruit of the vine and, that's, and they pass that cup around to their members. Other congregations, you know, they use smaller cups and divide that cup up and, they, you know, and everybody gets a smaller portion and you know, hygiene, so on and so forth. And you have brethren that actually refuse to have fellowship with each other because they perform this ceremony in a different way. And they're forgetting that <laughs> the whole point of the ceremony is to demonstrate our unity in Christ. So can you imagine creating disunity and using the ceremony that underscores our unity in one body in order to create that disunity? That's where you know, we, <laughs> we take the ceremony and we lift it very high and we forget the mercy and the justice and the love. Okay? So I'm not advocating we throw all the ceremonies out. We have plenty of information on how to conduct the communion, how to do baptism, how to worship. I'm not, I'm not saying we need to change any of those things, but we need to remember the more important things of the law and what the ceremonies are supposed to, to point to. Okay, so that's one uh, conflict. Another, the Pharisees accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath by healing somebody uh, on the Sabbath in verses nine to 14. So they set a trap for him by asking if it's okay to heal on the Sabbath. And Jesus answers with the question, well, is it all right to do good on the Sabbath? And he uses the example of uh, rescuing or saving an animal's life on the Sabbath. One of, your, one of your animals has fallen into a ditch. If you leave them there, they'll die and injured and so on. Is that okay to do good? And he contrasts the value of a human life and how right it is to save lives even on the Sabbath. So he heals a man's withered hand to make his point. And his point is it's always right to do good. It's always right to do good. And they again miss the point, and instead of being enlightened, they form a plot to kill him because he's made them look foolish. Then uh, he talks about the fulfillment of prophecy. Chapter 12. You know, not Jesus, Matthew makes an editorial comment here. You know, Matthew is always careful to demonstrate how every facet of Jesus' life is in accordance with the prophecy concerning the Messiah. Remember, he's writing for the Jews. So here he weaves together uh, several verses from Isaiah chapter 42, which is about the suffering servant, along with other revelations during Jesus' life on earth, you know, when he says, uh, 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 this is my beloved, you know, when, when God the Father says, this is my beloved. He weaves these together to demonstrate that his meekness, Jesus' meekness, and his refusal to debate or clash with the Pharisees at this time is in line with what was said about him by the prophets. It wasn't that he was afraid to get into a fist fight with the Pharisees and debate them like they did. In those days, they liked to debate. One would put forward an idea, the other one would come forward an idea, and it was a debate. Jesus didn't debate them. And Matthew is saying, is, is, is going back into the Old Testament to explain Jesus is not debating these people, not because He is afraid or He doesn't have an answer, He's not debating them because the prophets said that when the Messiah will come, 
He's not going to be a brawler. He's not going to be a debater, you know, fist fighting with the Pharisees. He's not going to act like they act. He will be meek. Matthew also introduces the idea that the prophets also saw the Messiah bringing salvation to the Gentile world as well as the Jewish nation to prepare for when, uh, uh, when Jesus would do this as well or rather when the Jews would do this as well, in other words, uh, Jewish Christians reaching out. So then another accusation comes in, and that is association with um, Satan in chapter 12. So Jesus performs a healing of a blind and dumb man who was also possessed by a demon, and the crowd begins to perceive that he just may be this Messiah based on prophecy because of this miracle. Nobody's ever done that before. And the Pharisees counter by accusing Jesus of performing miracles by the power of Satan. So Jesus re responds to them in verses 24 to 37. And what does He say to them? First of all, He says, your accusation is, illog is illogical, that I can cast out demons by the power of demons because this would mean Satan is fighting against himself. And even this, if this is so, he would be destroyed. You know, a house divided against itself cannot stand. So the Jews, uh, then he says to them, you know, the Jews themselves would cast out demons and they claimed the power to do this was from God. So why do they doubt that His power is from God? There's something wrong with them. You know, let's face it. I mean, um, if you ascribe the identical effect on two different causes, then you know, you're confused. If you people are casting out demons by the power of God, how can I be casting out deacons, by de not deacons, <laughs> demons? <laughs> Is that a Freudian slip? Anyways, how can I you know, cast out demons by Satan's power? You know, it doesn't work that way. So Jesus doesn't allow them to escape the obvious conclusion that if His power is from God, then what He claims is true. That's the problem. So the miracle not only demonstrates His power from God, but also that His power is greater than Satan's power. And then the final conclusion is that those who accuse Him or are not for Him are automatically against Him. There's no neutral ground. You know, he came to sow the seed. He came to catch the fish. He came to find the sheep. And those who are against Him, they do the opposite. They scatter the seed. They lose the fish, they can't find the sheep, they scatter the sheep, and this will always be the work of the devil. He will always, always try to undo the good that Jesus does and His disciples do. And then Jesus rebukes them for their false accusations against Him. So blasphemy here comes from two words, meaning injure and speech, injurious speech. You know, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that's in this section here. So to speak injuriously or badly about anyone, including Jesus, as they had just done, he says this can be forgiven. But to do so against the Holy Spirit, he says, this will, be, this will not be forgiven. He says never forgiven. That's pretty harsh. Now why is this so? It comes up at every class that talks about this. Probably because it is the Spirit who convicts the world of sin, and it is the Spirit that leaves us, uh, leads us to uh, repentance. Right? John chapter 16, verse 8. So think now. The Spirit's the one that convicts us of sin. The Spirit is the one who gives God's word and leads us to God's word. So if you speak against Him and you reject Him, there's no other power to lead you once again to repentance and the forgiveness that comes from repentance. You've simp it's like the Holy Spirit is the bridge that takes you to salvation. If you burn that bridge down, who else is going to take you there, right? So Jesus is warning the Pharisees that they are dangerously close to this point because they are blaspheming Him within whom resides the Holy Spirit and by whose power he was doing the miracles. So the Lord comments on their accusation against them, and He's saying to them, look, make up your minds based on the facts. Good fruit comes from good trees and vice versa. Look at the fruit that I'm producing and judge. 
And he says to them, the fruit of your lips already reveal what is in your hearts. To accuse me of being with Satan after seeing all of my good works demonstrates how twisted you are inside. How could you, how could you do that? And then a specific statement to them concerning their confusion. They choose not to confess him, but rather to blaspheme him and how it will come back to judge them in the last day. Remember he says, whoever confesses me before man, I'll confess him before my father, right? And whoever denies me before men, I will deny him before my father. So can you imagine what happens to the guy who blasphemes him in front of the father? You know, where, where do you go from there? So the Lord comments, as I say, on their accusations. And then finally, there's a general warning to everyone concerning the use of their tongues and how our own words and hearts will judge us in the end. You know, people say, oh man, I'll be judged for everything I said. I'm nervous, I'm, af I'm afraid. And the good thing about being a Christian, the only words out of your mouth that you'll be judged by are the words that you spoke before you were baptized. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Those are the words that you're going to be judged by. Yeah, did I hear somebody go <laughs> Oh wait, that was my kid, but anyways. All right, seeking a sign. We're getting to the end here, 38 to 45. So the Pharisees assigned his miracles to Satan. The scribes, who were the learned lawyers, were not satisfied with these works of mercy and grace. They wanted something spectacular. You know, show us a sign, they say. When they say show us a sign, they don't mean do another healing. They want a sign, like they want the sun to stop in the heavens. They want the manna to come down. You know what I'm saying? They want one of those signs. They want a mosaic sign, you know, the water being separated. Show us a sign, okay? So Jesus responds that the only sign given to them would be that of Jonah in the whale. You know, Jonah was three days and nights in the whale and brought out in the same way that Jesus would be three days and three nights in the grave and then brought out. This would be the final and most convincing sign to demonstrate His deity and His person. But he compares his, their reaction to Him to two others. He, you know, he says to them, the only sign I'm giving you is the sign of Jonah. They need to figure that one out. But then he says, the way you react to me, you remind me of two other people. First, he says, um, he talks about Nineveh. He says, Nineveh, these pagans, these evil people, they repented after hearing Jonah's message and they, after receiving much more proof Refused. In other words, Jonah went in, preached to these pagans, they repented. Here I am doing miracles in front of you, teaching you according to your own prophets, and you won't believe me. I've given you a ton more you know, thing, uh, proof than Jonah ever gave to Nineveh. So he says they will be judged for their disbelief. And it'll be in marked contrast to those Gentiles who long ago believed and repented and will be judged accordingly. Okay? Now remember, Jesus knows that the, the impending doom is coming in 70 AD. And then he compares them to someone else, and that is the Queen of Sheba. You know, he says, she traveled a thousand miles to hear Solomon, and they refused to hear him who is right there in front of them. Again, a contrast that will condemn them in the end. So he gives an illustration that pictures the generation of Jews that he's talking to as a man possessed. So let's read this passage here. It says, now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go in and live there and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. A hard passage, we're trying to make sense of it. That's why I wanted to read this one. So here Jesus is shedding light, casting out the demons by which they are threatened and controlled. In other words, His ministry, the fact that he's casting out demons of out of people to demonstrate his power, 
The fact that he's preaching to them and he's bringing light to them, okay? He's comparing what he's doing to the person who you know, has the demons cast out of them. A lot of times we, we're, we apply this passage to an individual. It helps to understand that if you apply the passage to the Jews as a nation, it makes a whole lot more sense. Okay, so what are the demons being cast out and so on and so forth in the light? Well, you know, Jesus is there, He's the light, he's, the, he's showing miracles, He's actually casting out demons and showing His power. He's doing that, He's cleaning up. So the cleansed nation, right, that has had the proof now, visible proof of His power and who He is, what do they do? They reject Him. They reject His spirit. And so what happens? They're left worse off in the end than at the beginning because after rejecting Him, they will be totally under Satan's control and the demons. So to those who seek a sign, He tells them that their request is a sign of their lack of faith and pending destruction. But He does reveal what sign they should be looking for. You know, the sign of Jonah, hopefully after he dies and he's resurrected, maybe they'll think of what he said. Oh, that's what he was talking about, three days. He was in the earth three days and he resurrected. We know that they didn't get it, but at least he gave them, he gave them the chance. Okay? So by not accepting Jesus as Lord of the house of Israel, they're left empty and vulnerable. That's what he's saying. He's not talking about an individual person. He's using this to compare what's going to happen to the Jewish nation. He's come to cleanse them, to remove the demons, they reject Him, they stay empty, they don't accept His Spirit. So He's saying, okay, you don't accept my Spirit to come in and live with you? Fine. There'll be seven worse things that happen to you after I'm gone. Okay, one last thing, conflict with His family until the end. It says, while He was still speaking to the crowds, behold, His mother and brothers were standing outside seeking to speak to Him. Someone said to Him, behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother, sister, and mother. So um, in the middle of his response to the scribes, he's told that his mother and brothers want to speak to him. In Mark chapter 3, verse 21, Mark tells us that they thought he had lost his senses. They wanted to bring him home. Perhaps the accusation that he was possessed by Beelzebub moved them to action. His brothers and his mother, you know, they're saying, uh-oh, he's in trouble. He, he's in trouble with the, with the law. He's in trouble with the big guys. They're accusing him of being possessed. You know, we we got to bring the boy home. Bring him north. Maybe a little calm down, you know, a little time on the water, be, be okay. So Jesus not only responds to them in his, you know, in his response, but he questions the very essence of their relationship with him. Their claim to him was their physical relationship to him. And he responds that his true family is made up of those who do the will of God, and the will of God is that everyone believe in his son. So in the conflict with his family, Jesus extends his invitation to them as He has done to the scribes and to the Pharisees and to the disciples and to the multitudes to be united with Him through faith and through obedience. And anyone who has had a conflict with their family because of their faith in Jesus knows exactly what is happening here, exactly what is going on. There comes a time when your relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ is even stronger than your relationship with your actual brothers and sisters. Why? Because faith in Christ bonds you ever so closely, more so than your, your relationship with your unbelieving you know, parents or sisters or brothers and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's the end of that. Uh, let's uh, keep reading. I keep encouraging you to read on so this makes a whole lot more sense to you. And uh, we need to be at, let me just look at this here. Uh, chapter 13, 1 to 52, so read ahead and we shall continue. Thank you very much.